So directives. So what are directives? Uh, <clears throat> I think directives are the coolest features of Angular because what they basically let you do is teach the browser new tricks. Uh, somebody on the Twitter uh, had an awesome quote, which I, I think I'm, I'm very proud of that they use this particular quote, but basically they said, uh, I'm pretty sure HTML6 goes under the name of Angular. And I think the reason why the person said that is because you know Angular um, allows you to make new vocabulary for HTML6, for, sorry, for HTML, um, so that you can um, emulate <clears throat> just about any uh, construct you can think of. And the moment you get in the business of emulating construct, what you really are in the business of is creating DSL. Uh, everybody knows what DSL is, right? Doing a specific language. And so the DSL for your application becomes, you know, HTML is really good at one thing, and that's static documents. Um, but with, with the introduction of, of directives, you can extend the vocabulary, and so now you can, you know, whatever you think you wish you had in, in, HTML, in HTML and you don't have it in there, well, now you can have it with directives. So the directives is basically this magic. There's also this magic that is very unique to Angular. You know, no other framework has anything like this. Uh, you know, there's other frameworks, uh, for example, Knockout, and I'm not an expert in Knockout, uh, but they use the same philosophy of using attributes, of putting uh, extra uh, behavior in, in kind of the HTML and then bind to those behaviors. But it turns out that in Knockout, the, the, the set of vocabulary that they have is fixed. You know, if, uh, if the authors of Knockout didn't put it in there, you can't have it. But Angular is very, very different in the sense that we are the meta framework, right? We allow you to make your, you know, to customize these directives for yourself. So let's talk about what directives are because, well, judging from the mailing list and IRC questions and so on, I mean, there's a lot of confusion about them and it's probably my fault uh, because uh, I should have done a better job documenting. But <clears throat> at the same time, it's, it is something that's super complicated and there is, we're trying every day making it simpler, but you know, it's just a complex piece of stuff. So anyways, let's dive into it. So the first thing I want to show you is uh, how Angular actually bootstraps itself. You know, how, how does the, the whole thing kicks in? So normally you put, uh, right here you put ng-app, right? I'm all familiar with this. By the way, I love questions. So as I'm talking, if you, if you want to know anything, just come up to the microphone and ask. Um, you know, you have to you have t-shirts for good questions and you don't have to worry about derailing me. So normally you do ng-app. And this is kind of a meta directive that kind of bootstraps the whole application. But it doesn't, in order for you to understand what's actually going under the hood, I've created a manual bootstrapping process. And the manual bootstrapping process is basically here. And I'm going to go through it. So, you know, as, as every application has to have, you have to wait for unload event. You know, you have to wait for the DOM to load. Once the DOM is loaded, you can do a couple of things to kind of get the application going. So the first thing we have to do is we have to find the root of the document. Normally, this is where the, the location of ng app, but in our case, it's just a root element. Then we have to list a set of modules. Um, modules is probably another tech talk uh, we're going to have to have um, probably in the next meetup to just discuss them. Um, anyways, Angular has a built-in module called ng, and that's the thing that uh, has all of the directives and all the magic in there. It turns out that the same APIs we use for building Angular are the same APIs you get to use for building your own directives. So there's nothing special. We don't have any special access to the system, uh, which is important because it means that whatever we can do, you can do as well. So there's this hidden uh, directive called, mod sorry, a hidden module called uh, ng, which you normally don't have to specify explicitly, but we because we're doing a manual bootstrap, we have to do that. So the next one is my application, and the my application, that one uh, simply says, you know, make a new module called my app, nothing really interesting there. And the last one is kind of an inline uh, module, and what this one does is basically tells the module system where the root element is. You know, the root element which we got, the hold off says, you know, this is the root element, so from now on, this is what it is. Anyways, uh, it turns out everything in Angular is dependency injected, and so this is no different. So we create a root injector, and uh, we only create one injector per application. So if you're ever in the business of creating a new injector, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, and from the injector, we get a hold of the compile service. Uh, this is what does all of the magic, and we'll talk about this a lot more. And what the compile service does is, it, is once it, it basically traverses the DOM, starting at the root element. And it looks for directives, and we'll talk more about how this, this is happening. But once it discovers these directives, it executes its compile function, 
and the compile function is responsible for returning the link function. Again, we're going to talk, talk about all this stuff in more detail. Um, and it returns this thing called the composite linking function, which is essentially a collection of all the linking functions in a system. And I know a lot of people, I'm sure, have had questions about what's the difference in compile and linking functions. Um, so the, why we call it compile and linking function? Basically, the reason is uh, we kind of borrowed it from the idea of you know compiling in C. You know, you have to compile your objects and create an objects file, and you have to link them together. And so something very similar is happening here, where the first phase is we're simply looking for the directives, and that's, we're calling this the compile phase. And once we locate all the directives, we have the linking phase, which actually attaches it to the scope. Um, <clears throat> So the next, next part is we get a hold of the root scope. Every application has exactly one root scope. And then we call the composite linking function with the root scope. And we kick uh, the Angular to say, hey, go. And this is basically the whole bootstrapping process. So let me show you this inside of a debugger, what it looks like. Uh, so I'm already got myself to the injector. And so now if we look at the structure of HTML, uh, sorry, let me pull up the application over here on the right-hand side. Currently, this is the structure that the browser loaded into the DOM. The, the, this is basically one-to-one -one translation from HTML to the DOM structure. There's nothing has yet happened because we are currently in, uh, in the, you know, we haven't done anything. All we have done is kind of looked for things and we have not even created the injector yet. So we're about to create an injector. So when we create an injector, nothing really happens. Uh, we get a hold of the compile service, and now the magic is about to happen. Now, basically, we're saying compile service, go walk the DOM starting at the root element, and go look for all those directives. And so, <clears throat> inside of um, our Hello World, we have um, an li, and and it's not cooperating again. I'm sorry. There is a strange bug inside. There we go. So this is what we're, so we're about to run the compile service. So again, let's go back to HTML and notice that we have basically the the raw directives as we have them in here, right? So you guys are familiar with ng-models directive, ng binds directive, ng repeaters directive. So now something interesting happens that when we call the compile function, we're actually going to execute the compile function of individual directives. Now most directives have no compile function, so there's going to be no op, but some do. For example, a repeater. So pay close attention to what happens to the ULLI node when I step over the compile. Let's go back here and step over. Notice it has disappeared. And if you look at the structure of the DOM, it has been replaced instead with a little comment. So what, what's happening is that the repeater says, well, I'm going to have to make a whole bunch of copies of these things, right? Because I'm a repeater, and so I need to be able to clone it. And so its compile function simply <coughs> ranks out <coughs> the content, puts in a placeholder, which is just a comment, so it knows where, it's, where the other items are supposed to go. And it internally then further compiles the, the template itself. And so the result is that at this stage, <coughs> we, um, we have transformed the, the DOM structure because we extracted the template out of it. Yes, uh, I assume so. I mean, if you remove a DOM element, it's probably considered a DOM fragment, right? Because if it's no longer part of the render tree, I mean, it's, yes. It's basically been disconnected from the original render tree, so the browser does, as you can see, the browser doesn't render it. So now comes the linking function, and then the linking function is, uh, every directive has a linking function, I think. Um, and so when we execute the linking function, uh, when you step over it, notice, again, nothing happened to the DOM. And that's because uh, linking function basically, it, it is, in essence, it creates the view, right? If, if, if HTML is your template, uh, which then gets loaded and becomes a DOM, then view is the live thing that knows how to react to different events. And so when the linking function runs, we create all the bindings. And again, when we write a directive, this is going to be a little more, make a little more sense. And so at this point, we have a live view. And except, as you can see, nothing's being rendered on a screen. And that's because we have to kick, uh, kick the, uh, the root scope and say, hey, go for it. Run it. And so the moment we run apply, voila, the whole thing comes together. Does that make sense in terms of bootstrapping process? We're going to dwell more into these pieces more. Any questions? Yes? How do you avoid content flash? <laughs> How do you avoid content flash? Excellent question. We have a directive called uh, ng cloak. You can check it out. Basically, it's a CSS rule that hides uh, 
basically the chunk of DOM until uh, until the compile and linking function goes through, and then the compile function then puts it back in. Uh, so that's that's how we do that trick. There's other tricks you can do. Um, talk to us maybe afterwards. But it's, it's a good question, but it's slightly off topic. OK, <clears throat> so uh, and we have a basic hello world. So let's go to the next step. So let's build a directive. And let me get rid of this. So I created this very simple Hello World app. And you can see the source code on the left-hand side and the actual app running over here. And I'm assuming most of you guys are not um, Angular beginners, so you kind of can translate what's going on. But basically, when I type, you can see that the name gets updated. I have a single controller over here. And the controller simply sets up name and leak um, variables. And then I simply have a piece of debug information to show the name and uh, debug down here. And I have an input, which allows me to change the name. And then here is our controller called demo, uh, demo greet. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let's write a controller demo greet. Sorry, let's write a directive. So um, I'm sure you guys know how to register a directive. Simply, you take the, the module for the application, and you simply say directive demo greet. Now, the interesting thing to notice over here is that we use camel case in this location. But when you're actually invoking it from HTML, it's, it's dash case. It's simply a precedence that uh, jQuery and other people have set uh, that in HTML, because it's case insensitive, you have to separate the words by dashes. But if you separate the words by dashes, then inside of JavaScript, you have to put everything in special curly bracket and in quotes. And so it's a pain. And to help you basically with that, we normalize it by putting it into camel case for you. But then you don't. Then the access is simply simpler. So <clears throat> the um, the console over here simply will we'll print the console out over here, and we set the text to hello world. So as you can see inside of the div, this div after the application executes simply has hello world in there. So let's talk more about uh, the compile and link function. Oops. Thank you. Um, OK, so let's make a, make a compile. Function, compile element, adders, and the job of the compile function is to return the link function. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a a printout over here, and I am going to change this and say compile. And it's going to say compile function. Label this just for our benefit. And let's say I, I'm going to do C element dot add class compiling. And this is where the confusion begins, I think. So let's run this. And let's look at the DOM structure. And so we see that the DOM structure has hello world, and it also has a class compiling. So why in a world we have two different ways of what appears to be doing the same thing? So before I do that, I'm going to do one more thing. And I'm going to say, well, is the compile element same thing as the um, link element? And when I run this and I look at the console, Notice it says true on it over here, saying the two of them are really the same thing. So why do we have this, right? Anybody want to take a guess why there's two different things? OK, so this is where the confusion starts. You know, People say, well, why do I use a compile function? When I look, do a link function, they're so similar. What's the difference? So hopefully, we can cover the, uh, explain this. So the first difference you notice is the signature between these two functions. Compile functions doesn't have access to scope. 
And again, if you go back to the bootstrapping phase, um, you will see that this is when the compile function gets run. The scope doesn't get created until afterwards. This is why the, we don't have access to the scope. Uh, but for, all, for many practical purposes, the two look the same until I do this. And then the differences start to become obvious. So notice the compile function got executed exactly once, whereas the linking function gets executed once for each iteration of the repeater. So there's two of them over here. And once we have a repeater, uh, we no longer, uh, the, 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 the two are no longer the same. See, it says false. So the compile element and the link element are no longer the same. You can also see that if I go to the, uh, the, the here, that the class, both of them have the class compiling. So now, how can it be? How can it be that both have the class compiling when the compile function get executed exactly once? And so the answer is that the compile function got to modify the template, which the uh, ng-repeat used to stamp out new instances for, for it. So think of the compile function as the thing that works on a template and the thing that is allowed to change the template itself by, for example, adding a uh, class to it or anything like that. But it's the linking function that actually does the work of binding the two together because the linking function has access to the scope. And it's the linking function that executes once for each instantiation of the particular template. So the only, kind of, the only kind of things you can place inside of the compile functions are things that are common across all of your instances. And that's not a very uh, common thing to do because you, know, you, you might place things like dom, you know, uh, uh, adding class elements. But typically, the class elements you add are different for each instance. So you can't only put it inside of the compile phase. Does that kind of make sense? I see a lot of confused faces. Like a single. I'm sorry? You, sure, you can think of it that way. Uh, the point is, it's the thing that runs on a template, whereas uh, the link function is the thing that runs on a, uh, an instance that's actually instantiated. And it's confusing because unless you're inside of a repeater, the two look identical because there's one-to-one -one correspondence between the template and the instance. But once you get into a repeater, that's no longer the case. And so a lot of people, uh, I've seen a lot of people write incorrect uh, directors because they put to, uh, things that don't belong inside of the compile function, they put it in there, and it kind of works, but then they put it inside of a repeater and all hell breaks loose. Yes? So if you're not using a repeater, is there a point doing it? No. So, so, so typically, unless you're modifying the template, you should forget about the compile function and just stick with the linking function. Because the linking function is the thing that gives you the proper instance and also the proper scope. So the compile function is purely for modifying the template and nothing else. OK, I think we've made that point. OK, so <clears throat> let's do more fun stuff. So this is kind of a, this is kind of a made up directive that doesn't really do anything, so I'm just going to play with it. Um, but let's get rid of the compile function, because as I said, it's very rare for you to having to use it. So let's make a link function. And let's try to do something useful. So there's a couple of things you might want to do with, inside of a directive. Uh, you, you might want to be able to talk to the outside world, for example, get a hold of a uh, event that from the user, for example, like a click event. You want, want to be able to read from the scope. And you also would like to be able to write um, to the scope, uh, maybe because of some event. So. <clears throat> Let's say we would like to make it so as I type over here, um, this thing updates over here. So you might, you might be tempted to say, well, how about we just say hello world, and we have a scope, and the variable is called name. Um, and so let's just write something like this. But if you execute this, uh, it works the first time, and then you start typing, and it no longer updates. Right? It's because at the beginning, the controller set the name to world, and so you were able to render yourself but then future updates, you simply are not being notified. So this isn't going to work. What we need to do is we need to be able to have a watch, basically. So we have to say scope.watch. What are we going to watch? We're going to watch the name property. 
Oops. Um, we're going to get the name out of this. And let's move this up. And let's put it like that. And voila, we essentially have our own binding. Pretty, pretty easy, huh? So keep in mind also that directives are the thing, are what the, all of the DOM manipulation should really be happening inside of the directive. The point of the directive is to be the glue between your DOM and your scope. So this is nice. Uh, but if you think about it, it, it doesn't really encapsulate the system very well because what you really want to be able to say, let's get rid of the repeater for a second. What you really want to be able to say is configure the directive with information. So rather than hardwiring to name, you really want to say, you know, I'm, I'm telling you what to bind to by passing the name into the system. And so the, the, we can set an attribute. And when we set an attribute, we can get a hold of this attribute in here. So instead of hard coding it to name, there is this object called adders. And if we look at adders inside of our console, you see that it shows all the parameters. And one of the parameters is demo greed. Now, when this executed, demo greed was pointing to nothing, so it shows nothing. Um, but because I updated it, let me up refresh this. The demo greed now points to name. So when I, instead of uh, watching uh, the name directly, I explicitly say demo greed. So, so watching the attribute on the element called demo greed. And this will now uh, perform the same same operation, essentially the binding, but it's configurable, right? I don't have to watch the name. I can watch other things than name. And so this is a this is a good way to parameterize your stuff. Does that make sense so far? I see a lot of confused faces and serious people. I like people that are happy, not serious. OK. Um, so going on and along. So the other thing you probably want to do is let's say we wanted to update the state of uh, of the name uh, of the of the parameter. So what you could do is you could say scope name equals ABC, and it would work uh, the first time. Uh, but what if you wanted to make it ABC every time you click on it? So you know we simply say L element, and this is kind of jQuery like. So you say bind click function, and we say console dot log click, and we do something like this, and we run it. And now every time I click, I click. You can see that the click's working. It's coming up over here, right? But nothing's happening. It doesn't say ABC. It keeps saying world. So what, what's going on over here? Well, what's going on is that there's really this Angular world and non-Angular world, right? And when an event comes in, when you're inside of jQuery, right, you really are in non-Angular world, and um, the 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 Angular just doesn't know that something has changed, and so you have to tell Angular about it. Now there's a lot of ways to tell Angular about it, and so you might say, well, let me write something like this, scope apply. And that's certainly one way to do it. And so now if I click on it, it, it changes. I type, click, changes again. Um, but actually, it turns out this is not a canonical way to do this, because what if name threw an exception? You would never know, right? Uh, so the pr better way to do this is to say function and place it like this. So now when I start typing and I click on it, it gets reset. And if an exception is thrown inside of this operation, uh, everything would work. Um, right, so, so the apply is basically the gateway that gets you from outside of the Angular world into the Angular world. OK, but again, there's a problem here, which is that we're hard coding it to name. And we would much rather uh, have it as a parameter that's being passed into it. And so there's a service called parse. And so I can ask for the parse service, you know, because this is Angular, right? You can just ask for things. So you just say, I want a parse service. And what the parse service, parse service allows you to do is to say parse. What are we going to parse? We're going to parse the attribute uh, demo greet. And it creates this function that you can call use for calling. And if the function is assignable, it has an assign property. Um, and then you can pass in a scope. 
and the value you want to assign to it. And then you are fully parameterized. So uh, if the if, if you choose to bind to a different thing, the whole thing kind of works. Um, so, so those are the two ends, right? You can read out of the scope using the watch, and you can also write to the scope. And if you're going to write to the scope, you probably want to use something like parse to execute the expression on your behalf. Does that make sense? Why wouldn't you just use bracket notation? Why not just use bracket notation? Uh, because bracket notation would only work for basic things like name. But if I said name dot first, the bracket notation would create a property called name dot first, which is not what you meant, right? You meant to say the name property on the scope, and then that object has a property called first. Uh, and so it's a different expression. So all Angular expressions that very much look like JavaScript, but they're actually not JavaScript, they execute through the parse service. Um, let's see, what else do I have on my list here? Question. Yes. You mentioned, thinking back to your directives, um, so you mentioned the bind function that we're kind of out of Angular at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, so no, you you, uh, you can find out this easily, and the way you find this out is you say. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. So how do you know that you're inside of Angular? Thank you, Igor. Uh, when I click, this is a stack trace at that particular location, and if you look at this particular stack trace, you'll notice that we're essentially in jQuery land. Uh, in other words, what you're looking for is an apply function. Right? There is no apply function below you. Right? So all operations inside of Angular need to happen and apply. And usually all of the directives properly transition you into the apply. So unless you're writing your own directive, when you're using our directives inside of your controllers, you never have to worry about apply. It should just automatically just happen at the right moment. Uh, but if you're outside and you're writing your own directive, you're basically outside of it. And so you have to know when to transition into it. Um, does that answer your question? So, so basically, the event comes from the browser, whether it's a user event or XHR event or whatever, a timer event. And it has to pass through apply before we can uh, do the operations on, uh, on our model. Uh, but um, you just have to know, right? That's kind of what I was saying. You just have to know. Well, yeah. Whenever you're using Angular APIs, you are, everything's going to be different. Microphone, sir? There's one right over there. <laughs> You know, I looked for it, and I couldn't find it. So whenever you are interacting with Angular APIs, uh, this is all taken care of you, um, for you. Whenever you're building directives is when you typically interact with DOM events or jQuery, uh, or jQuery plugins. And that's when you're not in the Angular world. And that's when you need to know about apply. But um, directives is something that you usually build when you are more advanced um, <coughs> because of uh, all the existing APIs. So. Um, I think you should be fine, and as long as you know if you're using Angular APIs, you're fine. If the event is coming from jQuery or DOM, then you need to call apply. OK, so this is the basic directive. And so what we have done is basically created an attribute. Oh, we forgot different ways of invoking it. Um, so before we move on, I want to show you one more thing. So this particular thing, we say demo greet. But it turns out you can also say x dash demo. You can also say demo dash greet if you like HTML. Um, these are all equivalent. You can say data dash demo if you really insist on being uh, HTML compliant. But you can even do even crazier stuff. You can say class demo, and I think it's a colon like that. So when I refresh this, it's not going to work. And the reason it's not going to work, because by default, we only bind to attributes. And so we have to help it out and say restrict. And we say we can do be attribute, or you can be a class. And now it works. Now, why, why would you want to bind to class? Well, you would like to bind to class, because sometimes you're using libraries like Bootstrap. And these libraries say, well, if you put these classes, then the right stuff happens. And what you really want to say using Angular is like, well, if you put those classes, not only the right stuff renders, but the right behavior is going to be there as well. And so you want to execute that stuff as well. So you can do this. And you can also do this. Uh, where am I? You can also uh, do demo greet as a task. 
tag. Unfortunately, this one also takes an argument, so we have to do it twice. And this will also work as expected. So we really have, you have a choice in the way you structure your stuff. Yes? Do you have any restrictions like, for all browsers? There's restrictions, yeah. Uh, there is no old browsers. There's only IE and everything else. <laughs> so in IE, yes, good question. What about IE? Uh, IE turns out likes the XML namespace, provided that you put XML namespace declarations on the top. So that's kind of a good strategy for IE. Uh, but it doesn't like elements that it's not familiar with. And there is a, there is a uh, page on our, on our documentation that basically specifically talks about all the quirks of IE. And the way you uh, get IE to cooperate is that you have to declare all of the elements ahead of time. And the way you declare them is you say document.create element my element. And then all of a sudden, something magically starts working inside of IE. Don't ask. Read the do documentation. Uh, I think it's fixed in IE9. Uh, but yes. Uh, we don't recommend doing this by default and only because of IE8. You can make it work if you do extra tricks that are described over there, but by default, uh, this is not going to fly with IE8. Okay, let's move on to the next thing. So this is basic uh, directive. So let's talk about um, now something that I, we would call components. And so oh, let's make me smaller. Okay, so here is a uh, basically a typical web page, right? Usually on the right upper right corner, you have a I am, and that's your who you're logged in as. And then in this particular case, I'm actually looking at a set of developers, and this is the Angular team. And um, um, the, the, the code for rendering the this guy and the code for rendering this guy is the same thing. So let's have a look. Basically, it's over here. Right? saying, if you have these divs and these images and this h1 and the set of classes placed over there, um, and also if you, that then we will render something that looks like a right-hand side. But because we have to do it twice, we basically are repeating this code along with this code over here. And so now we're getting into the world of reusable components. Right? We, we know that repeating yourself is a bad idea inside of code, and you want to be able to reuse. Right? If this was JavaScript, you would say, oh, let me extract the function and let me call that function because it's the same thing that has to happen in two different locations. And so in essence, what we want to do is the same exact thing, but in HTML. We want to say, you know, this is a reusable component. Let's pull it out and reuse it. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is pull it out like this. And, uh, and we're going to put it inside of a separate HTML file like this. Um, and then we have to do a couple of things. We have to say we have a directive called profile, and let's call it an. Let's, go, let's say it's going to be an element-based directive, and let's point it to that file over there. And now we can go back to our index.html. So obviously, if I refresh now, it's going to be all broken. But if I um, say profile, then now the profile comes up. And if I copy the same exact thing over here, then voila, I'm back in business. So that's nice, but there's a couple of problems with it. Anybody? Well, this makes all kinds of assumptions, mainly that it assumes that the, the thing that you're going after is email. So it kind of makes sense over here because demo, the controller, um, says that the email is me. Uh, but when we're inside of the, uh, the HTML and we're iterating over all the developers, we have to make it email. And if we change it to dev and we run it, whoa, what just happened? How come there's Mishko everywhere? Like I might like myself, but this is not the thing you want to see. Well, what's happening is that the profile assumed that the thing to look at is email. And it worked because we said ng repeat email in developers, but when we use a different variable, uh, the profile still assumes email, and it's because the repeater doesn't override the email. The way the scopes work, you look at the parent scope, and the parent scope happens to contain the email for the user, and so we have this situation where the, the user is being replicated everywhere. This is not what you want, right? Um, but it, it gets worse. 
Uh, and that is, you know, if you have a function in JavaScript, what's nice about this function is that inside of this function, you're kind of encapsulated from the outside world, right? You have your own private variables, and you don't have to worry about messing anybody up. And if I have a variable called x, I don't have to worry that the function that called me also happens to variable x. I know it's a different, different scoping, right? So when, let's create a linking function here. And so the basic problem is, that if I have them inside of a scope and I say scope dot leak is equal to and I refresh, notice that I was able to clobber the outside world, right? Not only am I not playing nice because I'm just simply assuming that the outside world is what it has to be this special thing called email, otherwise I don't work. But also if I happen to have an internal state inside of it, I'm clobbering it. Now there's a lot of ways to solve it and um, the simplest way is to say, well, we have a new scope. So this angular, this directive needs to have a new scope. And now you, you see that we're no longer clobbering leak. And why are we no longer clobbering leak is because if you look at the scopes, the outermost scope has the email, which is myself. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the iterations, here's the individual iterations, uh, they have a developer called Mishko, developer Minar, developer Voita, Voita and each one is writing its own scope. Each one has its own private kind of place to play. So now we solved one particular problem that we are no longer leaking to the outside world, but we haven't solved the other problem that we are uh, not parameterized, right? Like a, it's essentially as if you called a function that has no arguments and the arguments are in a global location. You just have to write into a global location and then you call a function and then the function knows to look in the global location, right? This is not how we code, right? We know this is recipe for disaster. So what you really want to do is say, you know, actually, um, I want to have my own private world, but not only do I want to have my private world, is I want to be able to take variables from the outside. And so in this particular case, if we look at our uh, HTML, it turns out that there's email is what we're interested in because email is used in both of these locations. So uh, what we want to say is that email is what we want. Now, where do we get email from is the question. And we can do a couple of things. And we can say equals. And then we can go to index.html and then say, so first of all, if I do this and I refresh, then everybody's broken because I didn't pass email into it. So what we have to do is we have to say email equals email. And voila, this, this guy works. And we can do the same thing over here. We can say email equals this is what time we bind it to developer, and voila, the rest of them work, right? So now we basically have segregated ourselves not only from the global state outside of us, so we don't actually clobber anything, but also we have proper uh, parameters that we're passing into it. Now at this point, a lot of people say, well, why this? Why not that? What if this is what I want? So if I do this, obviously it's not going to work because, well, that's not, so I have to be consistent. I also have to change it over here. Um, it's not going to work because we're we're actually passing the string email, right? This is kind of confusing because it's doubly escaped. Uh, but um, if we look at the uh, HTML and we find a directive, we find the profile, we see that the email. Sorry, why is this? I broke something. Oops. Oh, of course. Yeah, it's completely broken because um, um, no, because it's trying to read it as a string. So let me just disable this for a second. Um, and what I want to show you is that the profile has an email that should have been set. Um, okay, I'm not sure why it's not showing up. But anyways, the way to do this is to say we want to read the attribute. So, and it works now. So whether you specify equals or you specify at sign, you're basically deciding whether you want to use this style versus the other style. So you say, well, why do we have two styles? You know, what's the difference? Well, it turns out there is a significant difference. 
And the difference is basically that in this case, you're getting back a string because what you're saying is I'm updating the attribute email in a DOM and then the component is watching that attribute and the attributes have to be strings. So you cannot pass anything but a string here. Whereas if the first case we had, what we're really saying is that we're taking the expression and the expression could be an object. And so what we're getting is a reference to the object. So the two are really different beasts. Uh, and it really comes down to is, are you actually intending people to modify the attribute? Does the, does the modification of the attribute actually make sense in this particular case, right? So for example, ng-click. You don't really mean to modify the attribute ng click, that that's meaningless, right? But if you have image source, then you put double curlies because you're saying, I actually want to modify the attribute because that makes what, what the browser is actually going to render. Kind of make sense? So, yes? So if you want to pass a, let's say, a URL as a parameter, mm -hmm. pass that as a string or yeah, so if you wanted to pass a URL, should pass it a string or a, or a curly, um, that's that's totally up to you. Uh, it's kind of your your decision, unless Igor has an opinion about this thing. Uh, it, it's hard to have a set of rules that say, oh, you have to do this versus that. It's, it kind of depends on the context of, of the component. If I want to simulate something that behaves like an image tag, then obviously I'm going to use double curly because I want to simulate the fact that changing the attribute has a behavior. Uh, if I have a, like a, a full-on component, then I will most likely use it as an attribute rather than uh, as a as a reference to an object rather than as double curlies. Let's say uh, if there's a link and I want to render it as a link in the page, which mm -hmm. I can click later on. So uh, is that that's a good independent idea? because uh, the way that the that the uh, outside world communicates with the component is independent to the way the component actually renders the link, right? So this is how you would render it inside of the component template, and that's up to you to decide how the rendering happens. But keep in mind that the add sign, the moment you're using an attribute, you're saying what you're getting back is a string. So the other advantage of a, of a string is that you can have interpolation going on inside of the double curlies, right? So you can say, you can say something like email slash ABC, and then if you uh, run it, you actually see that ABC got added to it, right? To each of the, well, actually just here because of, of the top one. Uh, so if what you want is to give the user the ability to have interpolation, then you probably want double curlies. If what you want is actually get a reference to an object, then you, you know interpolation is, is meaningless because interpolation always gives you a string. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think that's all for this guy. Any other questions before we go to the next stop? Okay, so let's talk about the most complicated thing that people always get confused about, and it is transclusion. Okay, yes, let's talk about transclusion. So the component I showed you is nice because it, it encapsulated a piece of code, right? Uh, but the problem with that component is that that's end of the line. That component cannot have other components inside of it. Let me rephrase that. The component itself can have components in there, but that's not what you want. What you want is to declare a component like this, where um, you are wrapping something, in this case, a simple interpolation, inside of the component in there. So what you're saying is, take the content of the component. So let's say I'm a zippy. Zippy is this, everybody knows what a zippy is, right? It kind of opens up and closes like this. Currently, there's no content. We'll put it in a second in there. Um, but um, the, the, the key is that the content itself is getting normally, uh, the, the component that we have showed you a second ago does not allow for the content of that profile to be transferred, right? The profile was always empty. There was nothing inside of it. Does that make sense? Some people look still confused. Anybody still confused on this? We'll wait for the plane to pass. Okay. Um, so what we want is we want to pass hello in. And so let's let's have a look what's happening in here. So if you look at HTML, here's a zippy. And if you expand zippy, you'll see that zippy got replaced by its content. So where does the content come from? Well, here's a directive. And the content for zippy comes from here. And so what happens is that the zippy content 
clobbers um, the content that was there originally. And because of this clobbering, it is not possible to nest directives. But that's not very useful, right? Because there are a lot of directives you can think of, like tabs or zippy or a window or a model dialog box, although that's not a very good use case, uh, that you would like to model as, hey, there's this thing that goes around, and then I would want to be able to put the content of it, and I want to be able to put different content depending on where I instantiate this particular component. And so this is what transclusion is all about. So let's go back to the directive. So what we want to basically say to the system is, you know, the zippy contains a content. Don't clobber it. Pull it out. So you say transclude is true. And so before the directive uh, places its rendering HTML in its place, it pulls out the content and says, I'm going to save this for later. OK? Um, and so the next thing we have to do is we have to, inside of the uh, of the template, right, of the of the directive, say, well, where, where do we want to put it back into? And so we do this by saying ng transclude. Does <coughs> that make sense? And then when we refresh, voila, the hello world from the outside went to the inside. Um, so now let's talk about this some more. So let's have a name here. So now I have two fields, greeting and world. So notice the greeting changes the, the top portion, and this one changes the, the, the inside of the component. So if you look at the code, the greeting changes the title, you know, which we just talked about that we can use double curlies for the interpolation. And the content is hello name, but really the content could be anything. You know, you could put another zippy in there or nest them or whatever you want, other components, etc. But let's just keep it simple. Let's just have hello name in there. So what's interesting is that think about how scopes are. This name is actually a child of the zippy, right? So uh, let's go to the zippy. And it would be a tragedy of encapsulation if I could say escape name equals like this, and that would clobber the world in here, right? Do you, do you see what the issue is? If, if, if I wrote to name, which just happened to be the name that is used over here, then I would, because the content got transcluded, got copied to me as a child, uh, I would be clobbering the name, and therefore the, the copied content wouldn't behave the way you would think it would behave. And so now we have to do a little bit of dance with scopes in order to make this thing possible. So what we want to do is say, look, the stuff that goes inside of it, I know it's inside of another directive, but that directive needs to be isolated, right, for all the good reasons we talked about earlier. So it has to have its own scope. So when the so that it's isolated, we talked about earlier how the, the creation of the scope creates isolation, so we don't leave content outside. Um, but also it means that the thing that we copied in, in this case the hello name, has to have a scope that is not a child scope of the component. Because if it would be a child scope of the component, it would see all of the attributes, all of the properties on the scope. And so the thing I just showed you uh, would clobber name. So by writing into the name inside of the scope, I would clobber it for the transcluded content, and it would no longer behave as you would expect. So what the transclusion does is not only does it pull out the content, but it also pulls the content in the correct scope. So it copies the scope, it creates a new child scope, and uh, it actually creates the two scopes as siblings. So in other words, the component itself and the uh, transcluded scopes are siblings next to each other so that they don't inherit from each other um, in order to create the correct illusion of isolation. Does that make sense? Really? That makes sense? They're both children of the... The parent scope, yes. Scope. Yes. Okay. <laughs> right, so isolate scope is uh, is non inheriting, so that um, um, I showed you the earlier problem that if I didn't properly uh, provide 
uh, uh, username email, it, it defaulted to the parent email and then it rendered the wrong thing. So I want to make sure that it doesn't happen. So if I forget to initialize something inside of a component, I don't accidentally inherit from somebody. So this, the components have a non-inheriting scope. So that isolates the component from the context that are placed in. But we have a second problem, which is that we have to isolate the transcluded content from the component itself. Because you can imagine a component, and a component has a hole where the thing got moved into. Yes? Can you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> OK. So if we didn't do any of this gymnastics, then what we would have is we would have a component. And the problem with that component would be that it would see everything that is around it. That would be equivalent of you having a JavaScript function that would inherit all the global properties from the parent. And that would mean that if you would forget to declare a property inside of uh, the component and that such a property would just happen to be declared above you, you would see the wrong one. And that you don't want to do that. You want to basically say, no, no, no. As a component, you don't get to see the parent uh, attributes because that breaks encapsulation. So you flip a switch and say, uh, for all components, uh, we do not inherit properties. And that's how we isolate the component. So that's the first problem. The second problem is, is if you copy the, the content, in this case, if you copy the hello name, hello name right here, and move it inside of the zippy, inside of the, the body, so if you look into here, this is where the hello name ended up in here. If you move it over there, uh, then normal rules are, oh, this thing would inherit from the parent, and the parent is zippy. But that would means that it would inherit from a scope that doesn't see the parent, which means this particular scope would have a no, uh, no, it wouldn't be able to get to the name. So by copying the hello name into the, the component, you can no longer see the name. Worse, not only can you not see the name, if the name is declared, if, if the name happens to be declared inside of the component, now you see the component's name, right? And so that breaks, like that's not what we expect to happen with normal encapsulation. Right? So what we have to do is we have to do a little bit of gymnastics with the scopes, and we have to make them as siblings. And basically, the parent, uh, the parent scope of this binding is the controller, and the parent scope of the zippy is the controller. But one scope inherits. So in this case, we want to inherit so that if I refer to a name, I'm actually going to get the name from the controller. In this case, I don't want to inherit because I'm going to basically say, if I happen to refer to a name and I didn't declare it inside of the component, I shouldn't be getting the one from the parent. Does that make sense? So, so only the zippy is an isolate? Only the zippy is an isolate. The transcluded scope is not an isolate. Can't and, have their, they, they don't inherit, so you can't implicitly grab the parents from an isolated scope. Could you explicitly with the... Uh, dollar parent? Yes. You can definitely get it using dollar parent. Uh, so the only thing you can you get is what you uh, uh, declare inside of this declaration, and you can use the at you can use the equals uh, at sign for attributes, and there's also an ampersand for expressions that you can execute later, which we haven't talked about, but it's in the documentation. And so the way to think about it is you have a function with parameters, right? That's what component wants to be. Anyways, so this wraps up the, the directives. Hopefully, I've answered many of your questions, and they're less mysterious. Uh, and, and again, I want to stress that directives is really the, the, the unique thing about Angular that nobody else has. Like nobody else, no, there's no other framework that I know of uh, that can do this trick where it basically gives you the ability to make your own directives and your own attributes and build a DSL out of it, right? Normally, we build we build application because we just plaster div and div on top of a div and put a bunch of classes, right? But with this, you can build yourself a syntax. You can say, hey, I really want to have a zippy. So I don't want to create a whole set of zip, uh, divs to make a zippy. I just want to say, I want to have a zippy. I want to have a tab. I just want to say, have a tab. And you get it. And this is why it's so natural for the Flex developers, which I believe some of them are ex-Flex ex folks, right? Some, you, it's not embarrassing. You can raise your hands. <laughs> I, I, I'm an ex-Flex guy as well. Um, this is why it's so natural for them, because in Flex, this is the mode of operation where you just use MXML to declare your structure, um, and off you go.